Hello and welcome to today's presentation. This presentation is a regulatory one on OSHA, fire, hazardous communication, and workplace safety. Today's presentation was created by Misty Kevich, Barb Houston, and Amy Shortall. After this session, the learner will be able to understand why safety is such an important workplace issue, identify the requirements of OSHA and the law, understand key concepts of fire safety, review the requirements of hazardous communication, take an active role in promoting workplace safety and health. Some other objectives for today's session. Understand the company's safety and security policy and procedures. Take personal security measures on the job and commuting to work. Identify requirements for protecting computer networks and sensitive business information. And help prevent workplace theft. OSHA, which is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, is a part of the U.S. Department of Labor, where it regulates as well as setting guidelines for safety issues. We have to report any safety issues um, that are governed by OSHA to that organization. They include fire safety, hazard communication, personal protective equipment, and TB prevention. So these are preventative practices that we must have as rules and regulations within our organization to protect our patients and our employees. Let's begin our examination of workplace safety with a review of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA. OSHA is the agency of the federal government. It's their mission to promote safety and health in workplace nationwide. The agency is responsible for making sure that we provide you with a safe workplace. OSHA was created by the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970. This law requires us to provide employees with a workplace free from organized hazards that cause or likely to cause death or serious physical harm to employees. The law gives OSHA the right to establish national safety and health standards for all businesses and industries. Finally, the agency has the authority to make sure that we comply with the requirements of the federal regulations. Congress has given OSHA five key responsibilities. The first one being, OSHA's job is to develop safety and health regulations and to enforce the rules. To enforce compliance with the regulations, OSHA has the authority to inspect workplaces, penalize employers for safety and health violations, and require that prompt action be taken to correct safety problems. Another is that although the agency was, has considerable enforcement powers, it prefers to work with employers and employees to reduce workplace hazards that may cause injury and illness. It emphasizes a proactive approach to safety and health. In an effort to promote safety and health in the workplace, OSHA conducts research and provides employees with the latest information and techniques for reducing workplace accidents. OSHA establishes the rights and responsibilities of both employers and employees under the law. And lastly, the agency is also responsible for approving state occupational safety and health programs. State standards must be at least as stringent as OSHA's regulations, but states may also establish stricter, stricter standards. Now let's take a closer look at OSHA standards. OSHA standards regulate most aspects of workplace safety and health, including these major areas, fire, electrical hand and power tools, machinery, hazardous materials, materials handling and storage, and emergency response. Compliance with the regulations is mandatory. In some cases, OSHA spells out exact methods of compliance. In others, the agency leaves it up to us to decide how we will meet the requirements of the standard, as long as we achieve the desired level of protection. OSHA will work with us through its safety experts and help us comply with the safety and health regulations. The first topic we'll discuss today is fire safety. OSHA, OSHA mandates that every agency discuss this topic on an annual basis.
It takes just three ingredients to cause fire. Fuel, or solid combustibles, or liquid flammables. Oxygen, the more oxygen, the more intense the blaze. And heat. When these three come together, a chemical reaction occurs, causing a fire. Fires spread quickly. It can take just 30 seconds for a fowl to go from a tiny flame to a raging inferno. The intense heat of a fire can be more life-threatening than the actual flames. Heat can sear lungs and fuse clothing to skin. The heat rises in a room, varying from 90 degrees near the floor to a lethal 600 degrees at eye level. The air can soon become hot enough to ignite every combustible in the room, a phenomenon known as flashover. Poisonous gases within the smoke and fire can be lethal. Carbon monoxide poisoning causes 75% of all fire deaths. Fire can quickly fill a room with thick, toxic, blinding smoke. The smoke rises to the ceiling, forming a dense cloud that slowly descends. Beneath it, you still may be able to see and breathe, but breathe in even small amounts of smoke and toxic gases can leave you drowsy and disoriented. Fumes can lull you to sleep before the flames even reach you. If you cover your mouth and nose with a wet towel, you may be somewhat protected from the heat and able to breathe more safely, but you're not protected from the carbon monoxide. This is why every home and every facility should have at least one smoke detector that work. The key here is to be prepared. The best advice is being prepared for an emergency in all situations, including fires, both for you as the clinician and the patient and caregivers. We need to know the exits and evacuation of every building that we're in, as well as the patient and their family should have a plan. You can see the news almost every night and see fires that are occurring and people that may or may not have gotten out safely. So they really need to set up a plan and even practice it. Thinking about some of our patients with limited mobility on our home care and hospice or that are wheelchair or chair or bed bound. So this is important to talk about emergencies and what to do. Now let's take a look at some fire prevention tips. To be able to store flammable liquids and saturated rags safely. Turn appliances off when not in use. Teach your patient to cook attentively. Do not overheat grease or have flammables about the house, including loose sleeves. No metals in the microwave. Be careful with cigarettes or candles. Don't smoke in bed while lounging or near oxygen. And don't have flammable oil-based moisturizers on hands when in contact with oxygen generators, tubing, or storage equipment. Prevention of a fire is key. So let's look at electrical. We don't want to overload an outlet. And you know how many of the older homes have very few outlets in the home and everything's electronical today. So they have extension cords and 
it more adapters, you know, overloading circuits, and it usually ends up being house fires that are caused a lot by electrical. We do not want to use machines, equipment, or anything with damaged power cords and never exceed the recommended light bulb wattage. We don't think about that. We just plug in and put another light bulb in when something burns out. But a lot of certain fixtures are only able to take a 40 or a 60 watt light bulb and we throw in a hundred which gives us more light but it actually is creating a, a risk for fire. Now a word about using oxygen in fire prevention. Oxygen, it is all around us. It is easy for us to take the common element for granted. But for many, it is a drug, supplemental for certain lung problems. More and more people are using oxygen therapy outside the hospital or skilled nursing facility or, or personal care home, permitting them to lead productive lives. The body takes in oxygen and releases carbon dioxide. If this process does not happen properly due to illness or disease, the person might need supplemental oxygen. There are three ways to receive supplemental oxygen in the home. First of all is compressed oxygen gas. Oxygen is stored under pressure in a cylinder equipped with a regulator that controls the flow rate. Then you may have a patient with liquid oxygen. Oxygen this way is stored as a very cold liquid in a vessel where the liquid converts to a gas and you breathe it in just like a compressed gas. Then there's the oxygen concentrator. This is an electric electrically powered device that separates the oxygen from the air, concentrates it, and stores it. Oxygen in itself is not flammable. Unlike many other gases and chemicals, oxygen is not flammable. It is classified as an accelerator, meaning that if there is a fire and the oxygen is higher than normal, the fire will burn vigorously. The more oxygen, the larger the fire, and the faster it will spread. And we saw a couple slides ago that one of the three um, pieces of a fire is oxygen. So some key tips for using oxygen in the home and preventing fires. Keep oxygen canisters at least 5 to 10 feet away from gas stoves, lighted fireplaces, wood stoves, candles, or other sources of open flames. Do not use electric razors while using oxygen. Do not use oil, grease, or petroleum-based products on the equipment. Do not use it near you while you use oxygen. These materials are highly flammable and will burn readily with the presence of oxygen. Avoid petroleum-based lotions or creams like Vaseline on your face or upper chest. Check the ingredients of such products before purchasing. If a skin moisturizer is needed, consider using cocoa butter, aloe vera, or other similar products. For lubrication or rehydration of dry nasal passages, use water-based products. Pharmacist or care provider can suggest what to use. Post signs. Absolutely no smoking occurs in a home or car where oxygen is used. Secure any oxygen cylinder to a solidly fixed object to avoid creating a missile out of the tank. This might happen if it is accidentally knocked over and gas was allowed to escape. You also may want to notify the local fire department, gas and electric companies, and even telephone company when home oxygen therapy is started. Rest, request a priority service listing. This is for those times when there is a power or telephone failure or repairs are needed on any utility. When we look at fire extinguishers, they are marked with an alpha character or more than one alpha character because they're designated for different types of fires. So we have an A for wood, paper, or other combustibles, B for flammable liquids, C for electrical fires, and D is for combustible metals. So a lot of these might be an A, B, and C or an A and B. There are fire extinguishers that patients and families do have in their own home, or sometimes they live in a building there may be one in the hallways, or you yourself may have one at home. So it's important to know what type you have, what the letter is, and what type of fire it can put out. So it's important first to know what type of fire you have before using and picking the fire extinguisher.
Obviously, we want to first make sure that we notify 911 that we're getting some help, but we can use fire extinguishers to put out small fires in a lot of cases. And you can do this using the PASS system, P-A-S-S. -S. Pull the pin for the P, aim the nozzle for the A, squeeze the trigger for the first S, and sweep at the the spray and that's the second S so pass P-A-S-S -S -S. pull the pin aim the nozzle squeeze the trigger and sweep the spray that's how we can use fire extinguishers please take some time to review our environmental safety policy which can be found on the Celtic information portal under policies procedures and then under the safety icon basically this policy states that is the policy of Celtic Healthcare to maintain an environment free of hazards and risks. Every effort is made to prevent accidents and injuries to both staff and patients. All staff will receive safety education during orientation program, annual safety and services, and thorough ongoing education as need arises. Patients will receive instructions addressing identified risks in the home setting and an annual inspection will be completed to identify environmental hazards in the workplace and unsafe practices in the office. An action plan will be developed to address problem areas. It is the responsibility of all Celtic Healthcare staff to follow this policy. The next topic we'll be discussing today is hazardous communication and safety data sheets. OSHA uh, mandates us to do yearly education on these items and this year we have a few updates Both federal and state law require employers to inform employees about chemical hazards present in the workplace and to instruct employees in the safe use of these chemicals. Many of the chemicals are not specifically dangerous unless they are used improperly or contact a body for prolonged periods. Improper use of chemicals can cause skin irritation, nausea, fire, or even the production of hazardous vapors. You have the right and the need to know to work safely with these chemicals. You also have the right under the OSHA law to understand the hazards associated with those chemicals. You also have the right to know about chemical hazards in your work environment and how to protect yourself. The Hazardous Communication Standard or HCS is now aligned with the globally harmonized system of classification and labeling of chemicals. This update to the Hazard Communication Standard will provide a common and coherent approach to classifying chemicals and communicating hazardous information on labels and safety data sheets. So that's a new standard as of this year. Once implemented, the revised standard will improve the quality and consistency of hazard information in the workplace, making it safer for workers by providing easily understandable information on appropriate handling and safe use of hazardous chemicals. This update will also help reduce trade barriers and result in productivity improvements for American businesses that regularly handle store and use hazardous chemicals while providing cost savings for American businesses that periodically update safety data sheets and labels for chemicals covered under the hazardous communication standard. The updated hazard communication standard makes the following revisions. Manufacturers will have to ensure that product labels contain the following elements. It must have a product identifier, a signal word, a hazard statement, a pictogram, a precautionary statement, and a name, address, and telephone number of the, of the manufacturer.
As of June 1, 2015, the Hazard Communication Standard will require pictograms on labels to alert users of the chemical hazards to which they may be exposed. Each pictogram consists of a symbol on a white background framed with a red border and represents a distinct hazard or hazards. The pictogram on the label is determined by the chemical hazard classification. There are nine pictograms under the GHS to convey the health, physical, and environmental hazards. The final hazard communication standard requires eight of these pictograms, the exception being the environmental pictogram, as environmental hazards are not within OSHA's jurisdiction. The hazard pictograms and their corresponding hazards are shown on this slide. The first one is the health hazard in the upper left hand corner. This would signify anything with a carcinogen, mutagenicity, reproductive toxicity, respiratory sensitizer, target organ toxicity, or aspiration toxicity. The middle one in the top row is the flame for flammable objects, pyrophorics, self-heating, uh, chemicals that emit flammable gas, self-reactive chemicals, or organic per, uh, peroxides. The third one in the top row on the right hand side is an exclamation mark. These are for chemicals that ha are irritants to skin and eyes, skin sensitizers, acute toxicities that may be harmful to you, uh, narcotic effects, chemicals that have respiratory tract irritants, or chemicals that have hazardous to the ozone layer. In the middle row you have the gas cylinder and if those are for gases that are under pressure. The middle one in the middle row is corrosion, skin corrosion and burns for chemicals that may cause eye damage or uh, corrosive to metals. The third one on the right hand side in the middle row is the exploding bomb and those are for chemicals that may cause explosives, may be self-reactive or have organic peroxides. In the third row, the first one is the flame over the circle and that's for any oxidizers. The middle one on the, th on the bottom row is the environment and that one's the non-mandatory one and that's for aquatic toxicity. And the last one in the third row is the skull and crossbones and that's for any chemical with acute toxicity, fatal or toxic. OSHA has also updated the requirements for labeling of hazardous chemicals under its hazardous communication standard. Also as of July 1, 2015, all labels will be required to have the pictograms, a signal word, hazard and precautionary statements, the product identifier, and supplier identification. It, pictured in this slide here is a sample label revised with the HCS label, identifying the required label elements Supplemental information can also be provided on the label as needed. As per the new HCS standards, manufacturers will have to ensure that safety data sheets, formerly called the Material Safety Data Sheets or MSDS, adopt a uniform format. This uniform format must include the below uh, listed 16 sections um, and headings and employers must ensure that SDSs are readily accessible to all employees. Section 1 deals with identification which includes product identifier used on the label and any other common names or synonyms by which the substance is known, manufacturer or distributor name, address, phone number, emergency phone number and recommended use. For example, a brief description of what it actually does, such as a flame retardant, and any restrictions on use. Section 2 deals with hazard identification, which should include hazard classifications of the chemical, for example, flammable liquid, signal words, hazard statements, the pictograms, precautionary statements, Description of any hazards not otherwise classified. Section 3, comp Composition or Information on Ingredients, includes information on chemical ingredients, a chemical name and concentration, 
or exact percentage of all ingredients which are classified as health hazards. Impurities and stabilizing additives, which are themselves classified and which can contribute to the classification of the chemical, and any chemicals where a trade secret is claimed. Section 4 deals with first aid measures, which includes important symptoms, effects, acute or delayed, uh, which may require treatment, necessary first aid instructions by relevant routes of exposure, inhalation, skin and eye contact, and ingestion, and recommendations for immediate medical care and special treatment needed when necessary. Section 5 deals with firefighting measures, lists recommendations of suitable extinguishing equipment and information about extinguishing equipment that is not appropriate for a particular situation. Also may include advice on specific hazards that develop from the chemical during the fire, such as any hazardous combustion products created when the chemical burns. Recommendations on special protective equipment or precautions for firefighters in this section as well. Section, section 6 deals with accidental release measures which list agent emergency procedures including instructions for evacuations, consulting experts when needed, and appropriate protective equipment. It also should include cleanup procedures, for example, appropriate techniques for neutralization, decontamination, cleaning or vacuuming, uh, absorbent materials, and or equipment required for containment or cleanup. Section 7 deals with handling and storage, and this lists precautions for safe handling, including recommendations for handling incompatible chemicals, minimizing the release of the chemical into the environment, and providing advice on general hygiene practices, such as eating, drinking, and smoking in work areas is prohibited. Also recommendations on the conditions of safe storage, including any incompatibilities. This also will provide advice on specific storage requirements. Section 8 deals with exposure controls or personal protection. And this lists the OSHA's permissible exposure limits, threshold limits, appropriate engineering controls, and any personal protective equipment. Section 9 deals with physical and chemical properties. It lists the chemical's characteristics such as appearance, upper or lower flammability or explosive limits, odor, vapor pressure, odor threshold, vapor density, pH, relative density, melting point or freezing point, solubility, initial boiling point and boiling range, flash point, evaporation rate, flammability, upper and lower flammability or explosive limits, vapor pressure or density, relative density, solubility, the SDS may not contain every item on the above list, but because information may not be relevant or is not available. When this occurs, a notation to that effect must be made for that chemical property. Manufacturers may also add other relevant properties, such as dust deflagration for combustible dust. Section 10 deals with stability and reactivity list indication of whether the chemical is stable or unstable under normal ambient temperatures and conditions while in storage and being handled. It also may indicate any safety issues that may arise should the product change in physical appearance. It should list all the conditions that should be avoided and list all classes of incompatible materials that could react with the hazardous situation. Section 11 deals with toxicological information, information on the likely routes of exposure, such as inhalation, ingestion, skin and eye contact. The SDS should in indicate if the information is unknown or not. Section 12 deals with ecological information. Section provides information to evaluate the environment impact of the chemicals if it were released to the environment. Information may include data from toxicity tests performed on aquatic and or terrestrial organisms where available. Section 13 deals with disposable considerations, provides guidance on proper disposal practices, recycling, or reclamation of chemicals or its container, 
and safe handling practices. Section 14 deals with transportation information, provides guidance on classification information for shipping and transporting of hazardous chemicals by road, air, rail, or sea. Section 15 deals with regulatory information, identifies the safety, health, and environmental regulations specific for that product that is not indicated anywhere else on the SDS. And lastly, Section 16 deals with other information, which includes the date of preparation or last revision of the SDS. The safety data sheets that are commonly used by our staff or employees in the office are available via the Celtic Information Portal, or you can find them at 1-800-633-8253. And again, like I said, it's the common chemicals in our workplace, oxygen, cleaning fluids, peroxide, acetic acid, toner, germicidal or alcohol wipes, and common items that you would find in a patient's home. And as mentioned before, manufacturers must update their safety data sheets and labels by June 1, 2015. And we'll get, as those um, chemicals are updated, we'll get them all loaded on the information portal um, as necessary. The safety data sheets can be found on the Celtic Information Portal on the main page. Go to the I Need To section on the right, click the drop-down box next to Choose Task, and then select SDS or 
currently MSDS information to be able to pull up the, the current sheets. Another place to find the safety data sheets are under the Policy and Procedures site on the Celtic Information Portal. What you want to do is click on the MSDS icon to pull up the listing of all the chemicals and then click on the name of the chemical and that will open up that safety data sheet for that chemical. I encourage all staff as well to go to the Hazardous Materials Management Policy on the Policy and Procedures site in the Celtic Information Portal. This policy identifies materials used by employees and volunteers that may need special handling and develop processes to minimize the risk of their unsafe use in improper disposal. Hazardous material is defined as any material or chemical that is a physical or health hazard. This includes infectious material, radiation, ethylene oxide, or other chemotherapy agents. Health hazard is defined as any chemical that is toxic or highly toxic, cancer-causing, irritant, corrosives, sensitizes, hepatotoxins, nephrotoxins, agents that act on the blood system, or that damage the lung, skin, eyes, or mucous membranes. Again, please go to the Celtic Information Portal Policy and Procedures section and review the Hazardous Materials Management Policy. The Safe Medical Device Act is now included in the yearly mandatory education. The policy is found on the Policy and Procedures site under the Core section. It has to do with incidents, patient, caregiver, or staff that occur with use of medical equipment or devices. Medical equipment malfunction can cause serious illness, serious injury, or even death. There is certain protocol to follow in that event that an incident occurs due to equipment or device malfunction. Another patient safety policy would be on our Safe Medical Device Act policy. Any individual, really any clinician, who witnesses, discovers, or otherwise becomes aware of information that suggests that a medical device may have caused or contributed to the death of or serious injury to or serious illness of a patient or staff person is responsible for immediately reporting that incident to his or her supervisor, and an incident report will be completed at that time. Things that are medical devices are obviously IV pumps, they could be the negative pressure pumps, any other type of a medical equipment, even though we did not take the equipment to the home or it is not our property, we have the responsibility to report that.
You are responsible for immediately reporting the incident to your supervisor and completing the incident report. You are responsible for notifying the primary care physician and medical attention will be provided immediately. The incident will be documented in the medical device reporting form. The suspected equipment is impounded, left as is and not disconnected if possible and tagged indicating the incident, the time of incident, and who will be inspecting the equipment. If a serious injury or death occurs from the incident, the MedWatch FDA Form 3500A is completed and forwarded to the manufacturer within 10 working days. Death is reported directly to the FDA or the manufacturer. If a serious injury or death occurs, we will have to follow the Sentinel event policy. Records of adverse events are maintained in files and reviewed by the Safety Committee and the Performance Improvement Committee. So the key here is reporting it immediately to your supervisor and completing that incident report so follow up will occur and the correct forms will be provided to your supervisor and to you for completion. The last topic we'll talk about today is workplace safety and security for employees. You may think that workplace security is a job for management, security patrols, surveillance cameras, and the police. And to some extent it is. But in order to maintain a safe and secure workplace, we all need to become involved. Today we're going to talk about what you can do to help make our workplace safer and more secure. And there's quite a lot to talk about, so let's get going. Well, what's at stake? The stakes involved in workplace security are high. Nationwide, crimes against businesses are increasing. Companies like ourselves have to be concerned about theft of equipment, inventory, trade secrets, computer information, and money. We also have to take these steps to prevent other security risks, such as arson, vandalism, and workplace violence. But workplace crime not only affects the company management, it also affects you. You want to feel safe at work. In fact, feeling safe at work was ranked third among the top five priorities of job satisfaction by employees polled by the Society of Human Resources Management. And then we have to be concerned about compliance with OSHA regulations as well. The Occupational Safety Health Act makes us responsible for providing you with a safe workplace and this includes security. During the rest of this session we will discuss security policy and procedures, personnel security procedures, computer security, how to protect sensitive business information, and how to help workplace theft. In this part of the session we will look at your role in promoting workplace safety and health. A safe workplace begins with safety conscious employees. In order to maintain a safe workplace, everyone in every department needs to be thinking about safety as they work. Everyone needs to be safety conscious, aware, and alert at all times. Encourage coworkers to be thinking about safety too. Always look for hazards such as objects left in aisles or on stairwells, wet spots on floors, open file cabinet drawers, leaking containers, frayed cords, and hot equipment next to flammable materials. Keep your eyes and ears open for potential problems so that you can prevent accidents. Also, fix the hazards you can fix, such as wiping up spills or closing drawers. Report hazards that you're not qualified to handle and do so right away before other employees could get hurt. Make sure you know our organization's hazards reporting policy as well as the names and contact information for qualified personnel to whom you report hazards. You can find this information in the Policy Procedures section on the Celtic Information Portal. Good housekeeping is an important part of maintaining a safe workplace. It's very important, therefore, that you keep items in their proper place. Safety is directly related to neatness because items that are out of place and not where that you expect them to be can cause accidents and injuries. You need to keep your work areas neat and organized. Always return tools and supplies to their proper places for the next person. Wipe up water or coffee spills as long as you're sure the liquid is harmless. Make sure to report any spills of substances that you cannot identify. Keep work areas free of clutter and unnecessary objects 
that can interfere with work processes or cause accidents. Make sure aisles, walkways, and stairwells are always free and clear of objects. Report safety issues such as loose flooring or ceiling tiles, frayed or curled carpeting, and so on. Finally, use common sense such as never taking shortcuts, staying away from the edges of loading docks, and not using broken or unstable ladders. Now let's talk about machine safety. Machines are present in offices, warehouses, factories, and plants. Make sure you know how to work safely with and around the machines in our workplace. Follow these simple precautions. Obey tags and signs on machines that say they are locked out, receiving service, being maintained, etc. Never try to operate a machine against posted warnings and instructions. Before using any machine, make sure the appropriate guards are in place and that they are undamaged and working properly. Report any problems that you may discover with machines. Don't try to fix it if you're unqualified. Don't try to compensate for or work around the problem. And finally, focus on your work when using a machine. Keep your eyes on the point of operation where the work of the machine happens. Also use your peripheral vision to make sure no part of the machine is malfunctioning or that coworkers are not getting close to impede the work or endanger themselves or you. Offices can be dangerous places to work too, so office workers need to maintain a safety attitude. Here's how. Make a habit of closing desk and file cabinet drawers immediately after you've retrieved or put back what you need. Don't leave them open even for a few minutes because that's all it takes for someone to trip over them and fall backwards over them or scrape themselves on them. Don't lean back so far in office chairs that you might tip over. Don't horse around with office furniture or equipment such as racing chairs on wheels down the hallway or playing catch with staplers. Be careful when handling paper to avoid paper cuts. Finally, don't stack paper or other flammables next to hot copy machines or printers. Don't store paper towels or other flammables right next to our hot coffee makers. In this part of the session, we'll be look at emergency response and important workplace safety issues. You need to be prepared for emergencies so that injuries and damage can be avoided as much as possible in emergency situation. You need to know how to locate the locations of fire alarms and fire extinguishers, as well as how to set off the alarm in an emergency. You must also must recognize the alarms when they sound so that you can respond immediately. You need to know when and how to use the fire extinguishers that the company provides. You need to have two evacuation routes in case of emergency because of one of the exits may be blocked by fire, smoke, or other obstacles. And you also need to know where to assemble once you are outside the building. Make sure you understand and follow our organization's emergency action plan, including the locations of emergency exits, alarm boxes, and fire extinguishers. For more information, please look that information up in the Celtic Information Portal Policy and Procedure section. We take security very seriously at Celtic Healthcare and hope you do too. Our company has a variety of security procedures in place to protect our workplace and our employees. In order for them to work, we need everyone to follow these procedures all the time, with no exceptions. Keep all doors locked, never prop them open, even just for a minute. Don't loan out your company keys or access cards. Accompany familiar co-workers where they need to go if they've forgotten their keys. Report unknown or unfamiliar people to the proper authority in your company and report security ga gaps such as burned out lights, missing signs, and damaged security cameras or fencing. Now we're going to take a look at workplace violence. Unfortunately, we live in violent times and some of the violence spills over into the workplace. Protect yourself with these precautions. Always take threats seriously, whether it's a coworker, customer, or contractor making a threatening remark or joke. Deal with it appropriately. Recognize the signs of potential violence. These include verbal threats, comments that people are out to get him or her, excessive or sudden interest in weapons, excessive or sudden interest in violence in the news, and blaming others for problems. Report any signs you observe to the proper company personnel. Arrange a danger signal you can give to coworkers to indicate that a customer or coworker is exhibiting threatening behavior and may act out in the next few minutes. 
Remain calm when people get emotional, angry, or upset. Don't mimic their behaviors by arguing back or raising your voice. Alert the proper authorities when violence occurs in the workplace. Here's what you need to know to prevent terrorist acts and to respond if one occurs. Computer networks are vulnerable to infiltration, so you need to protect your computer by following company policies that include never installing unlicensed or pirated software, never visiting improper websites or downloading questionable files, never giving out passwords and frequently changing passwords, and deleting suspicious emails. Handle business mail and packages with caution. Report unattended packages to your supervisor. When receiving mail, look for misspelled common words on the label, no return addresses or a postmark that does not match return address, oily stains, discolorations or odor, lopsided or uneven envelopes, and protruding wires, aluminum foil, or a ticking sound. Co cooperate with precautions such as evacuation drills. Follow procedures during an incident, including securing and the facility and protecting yourself and coworkers. Finally, shelter in place if advised to do so by the authorities. That means going to a designated shelter room, shutting and sealing windows, and closing doors with duct tape, and listening to a radio for further instructions. Let's take a look at some standard procedures for security. To keep our facilities secure and to keep you safe, we've established security policies and procedures designed to prevent crime in the workplace. For example, our policy requires visitors to sign in and be escorted inside the facility. This helps keep out people who have no business being in the building. We also ask you to be careful not to let strangers into the facilities through employee entrances, but send them to reception at the front door instead. Our policy requires you to report a lost or stolen ID immediately, and we ask you not to lend ID, access keys, keys, or other security-related items to anyone, inside or outside the facilities. Our policy also includes a reporting system for any security problems you notice. For example, you should promptly report problems with security systems or equipment, suspicious activities or individuals, anything that makes you uneasy or leaves you feeling insecure. Following company security policies and procedures is important to your safety. If you have any questions about this information, be sure to ask your supervisor or review our safety policy in our policy procedure section on the Celtic Information Portal. Now let's take a look at some key measures of security. In addition to our security policies, we take other important steps to make sure that the facilities are secure. We use security equipment such as surveillance cameras and alarm systems. We inspect work areas regularly to make sure that the required security precautions are being taken. We make sure lighting is adequate and replace burned out lights promptly both inside the facility and outside. You can help by reporting any lighting problems you notice. We also check entry points that give access to the facilities such as doors, windows, gates, and fences to make sure that they are securely locked when not in use. Think about some other security measures you've noticed around the facilities and how they protect all of us. And again, encourage you to go look at the security policy within our policy and procedures section on the information portal. Another way Celtic Healthcare tries to improve security and decrease the threat of crime in the workplace is by careful pre-employment screening. We want to make sure that you're, we're hiring people who won't be a threat to our company or to you. In order to make sure that the security risks don't walk through our front door in the form of new employees, we do two important things when hiring. We check applicants' references to make sure that there have been no security-related problems in their past employment. We also conduct extensive background checks on people applying for positions that would give them easy access to the company's financial assets or sensitive information. Now it's time to ask yourself if you understand the information that has been presented so far. Do you understand what we've discussed about security policy and procedures? Do you understand other specific steps we take to make the facilities secure? 
It's important to you to understand the security measures the company is taking so that you can contribute to this effort. If you do have any questions, again, you can consult the Policy and Procedure Manual on SIP or discuss it with your supervisor. Now we're going to take a look at your own personal security on the road. As much as we do to make sure you are safe and secure inside our facilities, you could still be vulnerable to crime on the road, either when you're commuting to and from work or when you're driving on company business, such as seeing patients or going to marketing um, meetings. Think about taking personal security precautions like these when you're on the road. Keep windows up and lo doors locked, whether driving or parked. Stay on roads you know well that are well traveled and well lit whenever possible. Keep vehicles in good running condition and always have at least a quarter tank of gas. Never pick up strangers. But there's more to personal security on the road, as we'll look at on the next slide. What would you do if your vehicle broke down on your way home after dark? or early in the morning on your way to see patients or to work, or on a road without much traffic. Here are some suggestions to keep yourself safe. Tie a flag on your antenna, put the hood up, or light a flare. Call for help if you have a cell phone. Stay in the car, doors locked, until help arrives, unless you need something outside of the car. If someone offers assistance, ask him or her to call the police or emergency towing service for you. Hijackings are another possible security problem on the road. What should you do if you feel threatened or as if you're being followed? The best strategy in a situation like this is to drive to a police station or drive to the nearest well-lit area with people around, such as a shopping center or a gas station, and call the police once you get there. If you can, try to get the license number of the car you think is following you. Think about other security precautions you should take when commuting to work or driving on company business. Our next topic is personal security on the streets. If you walk to work or if your work takes you outside the facilities during your shift, you always also need to be careful on the street. Here are some helpful personal security tips when you're on foot. Stay with the crowd on well-traveled streets and use well-lit streets when it's dark. Avoid shortcuts through tunnels, alleys, parks, and any other dark and isolated areas. Walk briskly and confidently, head up and alert to what's around you. For example, watch out for people stepping out from doorways in parked cars. Avoid wearing headphones and listening to music while you walk. You won't be as aware as you need to be of your surroundings. Avoid wearing expensive jewelry or at least keep it out of sight. Carry your purse, briefcase, or other items close to your body. Is there any other security precautions you think you could take on the street? Now let's take a look at personal security in parking areas. Parking areas on the street or even on company grounds can be dangerous places as well, especially when it's dark. Here are some recommendations that can help you keep safe. Always lock your vehicle and roll the windows up all the way when you get out. Try to walk with other people to and from the parking areas. If that's not possible, walk quickly, don't get too close to park cars, and carry a flashlight after dark. When you approach your vehicle, have the keys ready. Check the floor and front and back seats before getting in. Lock your vehicle as soon as you get in. Report any strangers hanging around parking areas or other suspicious activity to security or call the police. Now take some time to think about some other security precautions you could take in parking areas. When you work late or alone, you may need to take some special precautions. Make sure someone knows you're in the building or keep near a phone. Keep your work area well lit and keep doors locked if possible. Keep alert for unusual noises and movements. Be extra cautious when using restrooms, elevators, or stairways. 
alert someone when you're leaving and be cautious leaving the building and walking to and through the parking area or to public transportation think about other security precautions you should take when working late or alone what should you do in the case of having intruders in the building if you encounter an intruder in the building you need to act sensibly in a way that won't provoke an incident in which you could get hurt first of all don't confront the person if an intruder runs when he sees you fine let him go if he stands his ground just continue on your way and try to act unconcerned if he tries to speak to you lead him to believe that there are other people in the building as soon as you get away to a safe place lock the door and call the police while you're waiting for help to arrive make notes about the intruders appearance and pass this information along to the police once they get there the potential for violence is another workplace security issue that you need to be aware of and prepared to deal with especially important is being alert to signs of possible violence for example watch for troubling behavior such as that of someone who makes threats for or intimidates others gets very angry easily and often and uses abusive language talks about weapons or brings them to work believes others are out to get him or her blames problems on others and holds grudges demonstrates extreme mood swings or seems to be suffering from extreme stress think about some other troubling behaviors that might indicate that a person is about to become violent you can also take other steps to prevent workplace violence or deal effectively with potentially violent confrontations the most important prevention tactic is to report any threats or troubling behavior to your supervisor right away it's also a good idea to arrange a danger signal with coworkers so that you can warn one another in the event of a violent confrontation if prevention fails and you are confronted by a potentially violent person try to run away if you can and call for help if you can't get away remain calm show respect do what the person tells you and don't do anything to provoke him or her for example never argue with a violent person or tell that person he or she is wrong to be upset computer security is a key element for Celtic healthcare in protecting important business and patient information the technology that improves productivity can also pose security problems that means it's vital to take steps like these to ensure adequate computer security first use strong passwords choose passwords that are difficult or impossible to guess give different passwords to all accounts and change passwords if you suspect security may have been breached second make regular backups of critical data backups should be made at least once a day or a full backup can be formed weekly with incremental daily backups backups should be verified at least once a month to make sure you are they are functional use virus protection software and update it regularly which our company does use a firewall as a gatekeeper between your computer and the internet and Celtic healthcare security is great we just need to make sure that we are protecting it so no using the internet um, you know, unless it's for work purposes etc and of course there's more to computer security as we'll see on the next slide some other important computer security measures include not keeping computers online when not in use either shut them down or off or physically disconnect them from the internet connection taking advantage of your software security features check the tools or options menus for built-in security features we can also check web browser and operating system software for options for increasing online security which our IT department does do not open email attachments from strangers attachments are a common method of spreading computer viruses and regularly downloading security patches from your software vendors We need to protect our sensitive business information. We take many precautions to protect sensitive business information, whether it's on our computer or on our files. 
By sensitive information, we mean things like trade secrets, patient customer lists, and information about patients and customers, marketing plans, financial data, and your personal files and medical records. Among the precautions we take are simple and practical measures, such as locking doors in the file cabinets and restricting access to computer networks and email. We also limit access to sensitive information on need-to-know basis. Only employees who need the information to do their jobs will have access to it. If you work with sensitive information, expect your work to be monitored. It's not that we don't trust you, but we have to make sure that this information is well protected. We may also change computer passwords that allow access to proprietary information or card codes that allow admission to secure areas of the facilities when necessary, especially when an employee with access to sensitive information leaves the company. Now let's talk about preventing workplace theft. Unfortunately, it's a problem we all have to deal with. Your personal property, especially valuables, could be stolen at work unless you keep them locked in your vehicle, in a locker, or locked desk drawer. We also need to be concerned about theft of company property. That's why we ask you to follow established rules for security materials, tools, and equipment that might be the target for thieves. We also ask you to keep access doors closed and locked when not in use. Please report missing personal or company property to your supervisor right away so that we can investigate and try to get the items back. Also report any suspicious activity in or around the facilities. It may be a theft in progress. We'll take a look at some other ways you can help prevent workplace theft on the next slide. Depending on your job, you may be able to help prevent workplace theft by taking other important actions. For example, logging in materials when they are delivered to the facility, checking orders and paperwork against goods when receiving or sending out shipments, following established rules for tracking inventory counts, like signing out items that you take from inventory, keeping a close eye on accounts if you work with money, customer payments, or other jobs that involve the company's financial assets. Can you think of any other ways you can help prevent workplace theft? Here are the key points about safety you should remember from this training. Workplace safety is a top priority for Celtic Healthcare. Compliance with OSHA regulations is a legal requirement. Company policies and rules must be followed. And you play a key role in promoting workplace safety and health. And we need you to be actively involved in our safety programs. Do you have any questions in regards to anything that was presented in this, this educational topic? If so, you can always ask your supervisor. You can review the policies on the Policy and Procedures site on the Celtic Information Portal. Or you can also ask the Safety Committee at safetycommittee at celtichealthcare.com. Thank you for attending today's presentation on OSHA, Fire, Hazardous Communication, and Workplace Safety. Please take some time to complete the post-test so that you can complete this assignment.